ultimately what you're seeing here is that you're seeing that we're continuing what I call lecture 1.1, which is Galilean relativity here. And one of the things that I really try to stress is that Galilean relativity says that the laws of Newtonian physics are invariant for all observers in uniform motion. I mean, I probably should have said inertial observers. So that means that Newton's laws are valid as long as you're at rest or moving at constant velocity. So what that really means here is that if I have an observer at rest, they're gonna see a different physical phenomena. If I see, excuse me, if I have an observer moving at constant velocity, they're gonna see a different um, physical phenomena. You're gonna have two observers that see different things. And according to Newton's laws, both observers are good. Their, their physics is good in those frames of reference. Now, the only way you cannot have Newtonian physics to be invariant is if you have a non-inertial frame. In a non-inertial frame, because of the intrinsic forces of acceleration, you feel that you are moving. You can say that you are moving and therefore it violates Galilean relativity. But the important thing here, which I think is really, really hard to really grasp, and this is what people are going to really struggle with this thing here, when we really start to get into the problem solving is that there is no experiment that you can do to tell whether you're at rest or moving at constant velocity. No experiment whatsoever. And what's gonna happen later on, you're gonna just say, oh, if that person's at rest and that person is moving, oh, so their distances and times differ than mine. And therefore, I know that they're moving. You can't make that statement. It is illegal to make that statement. There's an acronym that I use a lot in this course, and it stems from the, uh, the term PC. What does PC mean? Politically correct. So if you use the word politically correct and you're doing something that's not politically correct, you're going like, oh, dude, you're not PC. That's not good. On the other hand, in relativity, I say relativity correct. So if you go on a problem and just say, they're moving and I'm at rest, I'm gonna go like, uh, 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 you're not being RC. So it's really hard to really comprehend how this is really working. So you gotta, I'm trying to set the basis because later on, it's going to be an issue. At least it's, it has been. I've been at Cabrillo 23 years. It's been an issue for 23 years. Maybe this year is going to be odd and all of you are going to go like, oh yeah, that's obvious. I doubt that, but that's besides the point. So what I want to do now is that I want to get into the mathematics. And one of the things that's really important here is that when I say there's no experiment here, right? There's no experiment that an observer can do, then there must, if the laws of Newtonian physics are invariant for each of these observers, then there must be a mathematical transformation that could take one observer and transform it into this other frame so that they see the exact same thing. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to now lay my tablet flat so I could just start writing on the tablet. Okay, let me see. There's a comment here. Okay, why am I not seeing the comment? Okay, so here, let me, they're talking about noise here, so I'm going to mute everybody. Okay. 
There we go. So now, here I go. So I'm going to move my tablet down so I can start writing. So now what we want to start with here is we want to start with Galilean invariant transformation. Now, these transformations are somewhat, uh, I don't want to say trivial, they are, but you know, the mathematics of it is quite simple, but what I'm really trying to get you to do is to just physically understand what this means. Because we're going to use more complicated transformations. They're known as Lorentz uh, transformations. And you'll see that mathematically, they're, they're considerably more complicated. But the meaning is the same as Galilean transformations. And so what we find here is that we, I, say, I said that this is a mathematical structure. That leaves Newton's laws invariant. Now, what do I mean by what do I mean by this? Earlier, I said that if you're at rest versus constant velocity, that these frames are indistinguishable. Okay, so if these frames are indistinguishable indistingu with Newton's laws. Then physically what this means here is that if I have an observer, so if I have an observer in the rest frame, now note I'm putting this in quotes. Why? Because it's not RC. It's not relativistically correct. So I should say at rest frame relative to earth or something like that. But for the sake of argument, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that this is in the rest frame. And the example that I gave to you here is that if I have this platform that's moving and I have this ball, this observer sees what happening to the ball, it falls straight down. So now if I have a second observer in the moving frame. Now, what do I mean by moving? So now if I look at this observer here, the observer in each of these case, cases is here at rest relative to the ground. So in this case, the observer is at rest relative to the platform. And this case here, the observer on the ground sees motion of the platform. So physically what you're seeing here is that in both cases you get different physical phenomena. So what happens to the red ball in this frame? It actually does what? It follows projectile motion. So each of these observers see different phenomena but what the Galilean invariant transformations do is that not only do they leave Newton's laws untouched so that, they're, that they see the exact same physics, but it allows the viewpoint of moving from one observer to the other. Okay, so let me say that again here. 
So when I talk about a Galilean transformation, what we say here is that if I come in and I draw a second observer on the platform now, in our previous language here, I call this number one. Right, this is observer number one. This other observer is observer number two. So if I look at it physically, what a Galilean transformation does, it essentially, so a Galilean transformation will boost. Now a boost is a fancy word for transformation. So when I say boost, I really mean a transformation. But a boost, so a boost though, it's a transformation that occurs at infinite acceleration. So you instantly go from one frame into the other. So this transformation will boost one observer into the other observer's frame of reference. So for example, if I want to understand how I go from number one to number two, I apply a Galilean transformation. So if you look at this thing physically here, if I look at this bottom case here, so I'm gonna look at this guy right here. In this situation where there's a moving frame, that is the platform or observer one is moving relative to observer two. So in this case here, I'm gonna say that observer one has a frame of reference labeled the S frame. And by the way, this is common notation in relativity situations. And then what they say here Oh, I made a mistake. Uh -uh. What I said was incorrect for right now. I'm gonna call this two because this two here is at rest relative to earth, okay? What I'm gonna call observer number one has a frame of reference that's different. So that frame of reference is typically labeled S prime frame. So what I can do here is that I can perform two boost transformations or boost. So I can boost from S to S prime, so that means I can move in a frame that's at rest relative to Earth to now moving relative to Earth. So note, I'm not writing relative to Earth even though I should because that's really the correct way to say that. Or I can boost from the moving frame relative to Earth to the frame that's at rest relative to Earth. Okay, so there's two boosts here. And so a Galilean relativity transformation should allow you to move fluidly between both frames. And because you move through both frames, you know, flawlessly here, Newton's laws in each of these situations should be valid. So physically, you could imagine here 
that if I, if I want to look at observer number two, and I want to see what observer number one should see here. So if I look at this thing a little bit differently here, so imagine I have this situation. And what I know here is that this thing is moving with some relative velocity, u. So there's observer one. Now, observer two here, we said that they're on the ground. So this person, of course, as we've already talked about, sees the projectile motion that occurs. Why? Because the ball is moving with the platform and therefore it has a horizontal speed of u. So now, if I want to do a boost now, okay, so I'm going to boost from s to s prime. So how do I boost physically from s to s prime? Well, this observer 2 must then move with infinite acceleration so that it also has a speed of u. So if it now has a speed of u exactly like the platform and then the ball falls, what does that observer actually see now? Well, in this case here, we could see that if I have two observers now, And everything is moving with speed u. And this observer is now suddenly moving with the speed u. Note that in this case here, there's no relative motion between both observers. And if there's no relative motion between both observers, then what do they do? They see the ball fall straight down. So they could have been at rest or they could be moving at constant velocity. But if everybody is sharing that same frame of reference, then you're seeing then observer two is exactly seeing what observer one does and they both agree that Newton's laws in that frame of reference look exactly the same. The ball trajectory then just falls straight down. So that's what a Galilean transformation does here. So there's a couple ways to actually write this and Probably the easiest way to do this is to sort of like draw a picture. So what I'm going to do here that I'm going to come in and I'm going to think about this in terms of frames of reference. So typically I wouldn't draw a platform like the way I drew it. But what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to do the following thing here. So I'm going to try to generalize. the Galilean transformations here. And the way I'm going to generalize them is that I'm going to just say this here now. I have two platforms. And of course, I have two observers. I'm going to have one observer do I really want to write? I think. You know what? I'm going to step back the way I'm writing this. So in this platform, where the ball is here, we know that this platform is moving. So what I need to do here is I need to come in 
and I need to add a coordinate system to this frame. Now note, I could have called this frame of reference my S frame, or I could, I could call it the, the, um, the S prime frame. It doesn't matter. So instead of drawing an observer, I'm now drawing a coordinate system. And what we're doing here is that for the sake of, you know, simplicity here to make it a little bit more clear, what I'm going to assume is that the speed of the platform is now different than the speed of the ball. So in this case, the ball is going to be shot here. So I'm going to give this a speed of V prime. Why V prime? Because it's measured relative to the prime frame. So in other words, this ball is actually being launched by a launcher. So when I say I'm going to generalize, this implies here, I'm going to assume that the red ball has an initial speed different than the platform. And the reason why that's important here is because when you start to look at your problems, you're going to see that the, the speed of the platform is different than the speed of the object moving in that frame. So the question that I really need to understand here is that I need to sort of like define what do I mean by these velocities here. So let's be real careful on how I define these things. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to write the following kind of information. So V prime is the speed measured relative to platform. Speed V is the speed measured relative to earth slash ground. Of course, earth or ground is just arbitrary. Okay, so in other words, when I say the platform, that defines the S prime frame that defines the S frame. But all observers measure the same relative speed. So U is the relative speed relative to both observers. And by the way, this is huge right here. This is one of my most favorite ways of solving a lot of relativity problems. So what I mean by this is that if the relativity is, if the relative speed relative to both observers is the same, then that actually sets up an invariant for all frames of reference. And it makes some problems, you know, actually one or two or three liners quite easily. So now, <clears throat> my question is this. How are V prime, V, and U connected? So the way they're connected is ultimately is how we derive the Galilean relativity transformation. So the way you do this here is that I'm going to think about a shift in coordinate systems now. So the way to answer this is thinking 
in a coordinate shift. That means if I define an origin and then something is moved from the origin, there's a way to perform a coordinate transformation to get back to the origin. So the way I'm going to look at this thing here is that just sort of like a mathematical, you know, standpoint here. Here's my frame, S prime. And what do I know about my frame S prime? It's moving with some speed U. Now, when I look at my other coordinate system, S, I'm going to say for the sake of simplicity here is that from here, I'm going to set this to be my origin. Now, after some amount of time, because the S prime frame is moving relative to S, it has now moved some distance over here. Why? Because, of course, it's moving with some speed u here. So if I now look at doing a coordinate shift here, we could see that the separation between S prime and S after some amount of time here has to be ut. That means if I'm moving at constant velocity, and I know for some amount of time that the frame moved during that time, then that just tells me then that, that it has to move that, that distance here, right? So this guy right here is the distance between two reference frames. So now, if I look at a coordinate transformation, this coordinate S prime is to the right of the origin. So what do I got to do? I got to bring back that S prime back to the origin. So if I do that coordinate system, the only way this could be true is that if I take my x and my x prime and my x here, and the way I do that is that I have to bring back this frame, ut, back to the origin, so I subtract ut. And remember, so this is the term that brings it back to origin. And I'll put that in quotes because even though it does that physically, mathematically, they think about it slightly different. So if I now have the coordinate transformation, if I want the relative velocities then, so then the relative velocity equation is then going to be what? D dt of x prime equals x minus ut. And if you look at this thing here, you get that this is going to be v prime equals v minus u. And this equation here is known as the Galilean velocity transformation. <clears throat> and so what you're seeing here is that this now tells me how I could move from the S frame to the S prime frame and see everything, you know, clearly. So let's, let's, let's sort of like try to interpret this relationship. Oh gosh, how do you spell interpretation? Something like this. I'll just put quotes because one among friends. So what you're seeing here now is that 
what do I want to do? I want to boost from S to S prime. Okay? So let's look at that platform example here. So that means I'm, I'm the rest observer. Now I want to be careful. Rest observer, what? Relative to Earth. And now I want to go and see the, I want to boost into the frame of the moving observer relative to Earth. So what we do know is that the guy at rest sees projectile motion. We know that the observer moving with the platform sees the ball fall straight down. So what does that mean here? So if I look at this thing here, what you're seeing here is that I have V prime equals V minus U here. So if this observer was to boost with infinite acceleration, what do they actually see here? Well, according to this observer, so the S frame observer sees the ball moving with speed u. That is, if I come back and I look at this example over here, we already said earlier that when I look at observer number two, or the S frame, the ball is at rest relative to one, but it's moving with speed u. So if it moves with speed u, then this means here that then v must equal to u. So if I boost from the S frame to the S prime frame, you could see that I'm going to get u minus u. And now we see that the observer that is now moving relative to the platform then sees that there's no horizontal speed. And if there's no horizontal speed, this implies ball falls straight down. I think there's a question here. Um, a professor? Yes. So does that um, coordinate system tell you the um, uh, position and the time um, that hold her? Um, like, I'm not sure, how does the whole um, 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 uh, coordinate system come to play? Like, um, I, I'm not really sure what you're asking at the moment. You're saying if okay. it's so like, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to say, um, does that, um, um, when it, um, 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 uh, system tell you like the time and the um, 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 uh, position it's at that you're trying to solve actually? Or sure. Like what, what you would do then or is, is it that you would treat this like anything else. So what you would do then is that if you now know the initial speed of the ball in that frame, then you just use kinematic equations oh. to actually solve that. Okay, now I understand. Okay. Yeah, because when I was sort of looking at that, I was not sure like what does that, yeah, but now I understand. And the other question was, is V, the speed V is what the observer, I mean, I think I wrote this up here. Let's just redefine that. The speed V is the speed measured relative to the earth ground observer. In other words, the S frame. Whereas V prime is the speed measured by the observer on the platform, which I call S prime frame. 
So you could see here is that if you boost in those frames, then you get that. Now, if I now do it the opposite way, let's say that I want to boost from S prime to S. So now this guy is the so-called moving frame. Now I'm putting quotes because I'm not writing the rest of it. If I don't say, remember, if you're going to be RC relatively correct, you always have to state which frame you're talking about when you're moving. So I would say this is the moving observer relative to Earth. So when I put the quotes there, it's telling you that that's what I mean. And then that this observer now is at rest. So, so if I look at the Galilean transformation, what we saw here is that if I'm going from S to S prime, what you're seeing here is that I isolate the prime from the other frame, in this case, the S frame. So note that this guy right here is a constant. So you could see that on the right side is the S frame. The left side is the S prime frame. So if I take this equation and I algebraically solve it for V, then what you're seeing here, I'm then going to get V is going to be V prime plus U. So if you're looking at this, this is relative to what? The S prime frame. And this guy is relative to the S frame. So now, here I go. What is the initial speed of ball in the S prime frame? Well, V prime is zero. The ball falls straight down. So if I now look at this transformation, as I boost, he then says that if I boost to the frame that's at rest relative to, to the ground, I could see that the observer on the ground is going to measure a speed of u. So the importance of a Galilean transformation is it allows one to boost between two inertial frames of reference and see the other's point of view. So if I was to say this in summary, then a Galilean transformation allows one to boost between two inertial frames of reference and see each other's point of view. I cannot tell you how important it is that transformations are a big part of actual physics it's like if you, you know if you go on to physics and you take more advanced classes it is very very common for people to transform between one frame and the other especially if you're trying to see if it uh, if it violates relativity by looking at do these inertial observers see the same thing so what you typically do is you take a theory and you boost into a different frame. And if you can't get the exact same equations, what that means then, there's something wrong with the equations. And people who uh, look at papers that are, you know, they have a new theory where they're trying to see whether this theory is even viable, almost always 
one of the first things that they do is they do a transformation. And typically it's called an invariant transformation. And if you get two different pictures from this transformation, they don't even read the paper anymore. They just toss it out. That's how powerful these transformations are in the physics world. So now I'm going to move on to the next piece, which is Maxwell's. Um, yes. Before we move on, could I ask a question? Absolutely. I'm still confused about how we got our Galilean velocity transformation equation. Could we move back to where you were um, using that like X coordinate as sure. the, the frame shifted and yeah. just like walk through that piece? Not, not a problem. How it brings it back to the origin? So, so we agree that the frame in this situation has shifted by a distance delta x. And that distance has to be ut here. So if I want, so if I look at the viewpoint of the s frame, what you're going to see here is that this guy has traveled some distance x according to the s frame. But in order to make measurements, relative to these two frames at the origin, I have to bring this coordinate system back here because if I only look at this coordinate system, then the origin is going to be right here. But that origin right there will not follow that, this equation right here. The origin is way back here. So the only way I can move this thing back to the origin is that I have to subtract a distance ut to get back to that same coordinate system. So for example, if u is zero, then you could see that x prime and x are going to measure the exact same things. And Carlos, which is x and which is x prime? Somehow I feel like they're switched in the equation. Then what would intuitively make sense? They're, they, they're not switched. And what, which is which? So, um, okay, so let's say that, let's go wet by what you're saying for a moment. If I switch them, so remember, I'm going to put an X here because this is not correct. Then I would have, you said if they're switched, then they should be like this here, right? Is that what you're thinking? Is X where the S frame is at the origin and X prime is where that S frame has moved to? Is that what those points are? Yes. And so if we wanted to move the S prime frame back, wouldn't we need to subtract that delta x from it to get it back to the origin? So I would imagine x prime yeah, minus. Yeah, look at that, that delta x is also equal to ut. Right, but you're subtracting that from x, which is the origin, rather than from x prime, which is that s prime frame. Because if I have a projectile, let's say, in the s frame, so that means I'm having a projectile move like this. What the S frame measures is some function of XT. What the S frame, S prime frame measures, it's going to measure X prime of T. These two guys are not going to be the same. So they're measuring, but now on top of that, I have two co I have a coordinate system S prime that's moving to the right. And because it's moving to the right at speed U, the observer S is going to see a position X of T, which is different than the observer S prime sees, which will be X prime of T. By the way, I bet if we had a How about if we do 
something slightly different. Okay. Okay. And what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to erase this right here. Okay. So as me, as I erase this thing, what, what I want to do is I want to do the following thing here. Now imagine that I set up my coordinate system right here. And this is the origin. Now I'm going to say that this is the, this is X right here. And so when I look at X, let's say that I want to, I have this point right here, which is at one. Now, if I want to move that point back to the origin, how do I write that equation? Well, I essentially have to bring this point all the way back there. And the only way that I can do this here is that I got to, so that means I want to write everything relative to the origin and not to the point one. So what we do here is that we take X and then we shift this by X minus one. So now I have a function, not of X, but a function of X minus one. And what that one does is it moves essentially the coordinate system back to here because that's the way we're measuring it. And that's exactly what this coordinate transformation is doing. It's bringing it back to the origin. So for example, if I pick a value of two here, then that means I'm going to get the value one, which is exactly what you would expect relative to one, because I'm only one step away from that. But if I had, so for example, so let's say that I now move to a point, let's say two here. So if I'm at a point two, which is in red, this guy's going to measure two. This guy here is going to measure two minus one, which means that I'm only one point away from the green point. So it allows me to use the numbers of the coordinate system at the origin instead of, you know, just in, and allowing me to write a function where I now use, I, I should have done that in red. I should have done this in green, where now this coordinate system at one uses this coordinate system here to make the numbers come out right. And that's what that is doing right there. I don't know if that's making any sense. That helps so much, Carlos. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I just kind of assumed that you, you did this in calculus and that, and I apologize if that is not true. Okay, let's move back down here. So the Galilean transformation allows you to boost between two inertial frames of reference and see each other's viewpoint. What you're gonna find here is that when we get into the full theory of relativity, one, you're probably not going to really believe what I say physically. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to set up mathematically a coordinate transformation. It's known as a Lorentz transformation. And that Lorentz transformation allows me to mathematically calculate what the ob other observer sees. And what we're trying to do here is that there's two ways to attack a problem. You could attack it mathematically using the Lorentz transformation, or you could physically look at it by using uh, physics. And this is where you're actually really, really understanding. And a lot of times people have trouble with both of them, but it's everything that I'm doing right now, it's exactly the same what I'm gonna do when we get into special relativity. But conceptually, it's just so much harder. And what I'm going to try to remind you when we get there is that I'm not doing anything different than what we did before. Everything's exactly the same. 
now the mathematics is harder and it's conceptually harder. Okay, so now I want to move on to the next piece. Okay, and the next piece here, we want to talk about, and in my notes at least, in my head at least, this is what I'm thinking here. You know, I keep putting stuff on my printer and that goddamn thing keeps printing paper. Sorry about that. So I'm going to say now that I'm on lecture 1.2. And we're going to be talking about properties of light. Now, I'm probably going to go way over your head for some of you. And that's okay. And the reason why we have to do that is because I need you to understand that light is a wave. So when I say the properties of light, what I really mean that light is a prediction of Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations are essentially what Newton's laws are to mechanics. Mechanics is completely described by Newton's laws. Maxwell's equations describe electricity and magnetism. So Maxwell's equations are just as important as Newton's laws. The vast majority of people do not know Maxwell's equations because they're mathematically complicated. It's much harder to see Maxwell's equations. So I think to really give you an understanding of where we're headed here, what I want to do here is that I want to go in and sort of like look at this from a historical viewpoint. Why? It makes more sense. That's the only reason. And it gives you some foundations of why we have to move here. Okay? So, from a historical perspective, This is what we know. Between 1600 and 1750, what we find here, a combination of Galileo and Newton um, developed a mechanical uh, viewpoint. of the universe. And that's really, really important because to understand the problems of relativity, you have to understand what we mean when I say a mechanical. And what I mean by a mechanical is that everything is deterministic, Galilean relativity dominates, and really you get these things called absolutes. And what I mean by absolute is the following thing here. Let me ask you this question. How far is it from Santa Cruz to LA? Well, you would probably say it's somewhere around, I don't know, is it 350 to 400 miles or something like that? I actually don't really know. But whenever we say how far it is, you probably go and you'll Google it and you'll go, oh, that's the distance. That's the absolute distance from Santa Cruz to LA. That's a mechanical viewpoint. And that's really one of the most important things about a mechanical viewpoint, as well as some other things about waves that we're going to look at. And then around 1750 to about 1900, 
Maxwell and friends developed electricity and magnetism. Okay? And a lot of times, instead of writing electricity and magnetism, it's common to just call it EM. And one of the key predictions of Maxwell's equation, a key prediction is that light is an EM wave, okay? Light is an EM wave and always travels at a constant speed. So when I say always, Maxwell's equations strongly predict that the speed of light is constant. So in fact, it's so constant that they have a symbol for it. So this is the speed of light. And the first time they measured the speed of light was in the 1800s. And it, it actually, I think it was in the 1600s when it was first measured. But by the 1800s, they knew that value extremely well. And what you find here is that the speed here is um, three times 10 to the eight meters per second and miles per hour, it's roughly 186,000 miles per second. And the, one of the most confusing things about the speed of light here is that Maxwell predicted that it was equal to this. So what's strange about this is that this is a constant for magnetism. This is a constant for electricity. And this shows that I'm, I'm really multiplying these two constants in this complicated way here, and you get this number. Nobody understood why the speed of light was miraculously given by these two constants. It wasn't until Maxwell wrote down his equations and solved them that he actually you know, explain why the speed of light is the way it is. And so what we find here is that we find this. We said, as we said here, is that light is an electromagnetic wave. What does this mean? Well, what it means here is that you have four equations of Maxwell that have to be solved. So Maxwell's equations are four equations and they're written like this here. And these are, this dal here is a vector. All of these are vectors, but I'm being sloppy and not drawing them. And what we find here is that E stands for electric field. B stands for magnetic field. And there's these other constants, but you could see here's the first constant, epsilon naught which is over here with the speed of light. So when they were developing 
electricity and magnetism, they were completely separated. And Maxwell also realized that there's a connection between the electric and magnetic field in some mathematical way. And then there's another equation. And here you could see this other constant, right? Here's that constant, here's that constant. And what you're finding here is that these guys here, what they're doing here is they relate electric and magnetic field. So using some mathematical structure, what you found here, what Maxwell finds here is that under special circumstances, And what are the special circumstances? You require time varying electric and magnetic field. Under this special circumstances, this is what ends up happening. These time varying electric and magnetic fields what they do here is that I call this process, so time varying fields self regenerate. And produce a system of coupled oscillators. This is hugely important. Okay, so essentially what it says here is this. So when I say self-regenerating, what I'm saying here is that there's this leap frogging situation, okay? There's a leap frogging situation. And what Maxwell's equations tell you is it tells you this, that if I have a time varying E field, what it does here is it produces a time varying magnetic field. And this in turn, if I have a time varying magnetic field, it then produces the process all over again. So then if I come over here, and if I just copy and paste, just to be quick here, Then it just keeps going on dot, dot, dot. So that means if I have a time varying field, that produces a time varying magnetic field. But a time varying magnetic field produces a time varying E field. A time varying E field produces a magnetic field that's time varying, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I mean by sort of like this leapfrogging, this self regeneration. What this also means here is that. This whole system here is a system of coupled oscillators. And if you remember from wave motion, a system of coupled oscillators is required for waves. So here's what we say then. A system of coupled oscillators produces an electromagnetic wave. So Maxwell's equations tell us 
that if I have a special circumstances of time varying electric and magnetic fields, not only do they self regenerate, but they form that system of coupled oscillators that produces an electromagnetic wave. And that electromagnetic wave is then plays the key role in relativity as we will see here. So what I'm going to do here is that to, re to talk about coupled oscillators, I have to then go back to the mechanical waves. Okay, what is a mechanical wave? So mechanical waves are the things that you saw in physics 4A. This is typically waves on a wave machine or on a string. That's what you typically saw in 4A. And another mechanical wave is ocean waves or sound waves. So the question that I'm going to ask here is what is a mechanical wave? A wave, so if I say word, if I say the word wave, what I mean by that, it's an energy disturbance in the wave medium. Okay, a wave is an energy disturbance in the wave medium. And then the question is this, what is a medium? And a medium is a system of coupled oscillators. So one example that I'm going to look at here is that I'm going to look at a wave machine. And I'll show you an image of a wave machine here in a moment here. But what you find here is that you could imagine that I have a series of mass spring systems. So what you're seeing here is that this guy here is my spring and this guy here is the mass. And what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to take these mass spring systems and I'm going to attach a metal wire to each of these. So instead of a single oscillator now, I have a system of coupled oscillators. So what do I mean by a system of coupled oscillators? Well, in order to produce a wave in this system, what's the first thing that I got to do? Well, if I come over here, you could see this phrase, energy disturbance. So in order to produce a wave, I need to disturb this system. So the way I'm going to do here is that the energy disturbance is that I'm going to do work on the first mass. So if I do work on the first mass, what you're seeing here, if I pull this guy down, it pulls that mass down so it's farther than the equilibrium. And so what happens here is that now there's a ripple effect. So as I now come in here and I oscillate this mass up and down, what you're seeing here that the wire between these guys gets moved. And what you're seeing here is that then the system is then going to have some oscillation 
that's going to look like a wave. But that would be my wave due to a system of coupled oscillators. Now, what I'm going to do here is that I want to come in and I want to show you a wave machine. Okay, so if I come in here, I'm going to paste this video here. Now, note that this is not a great video, but it, it's, hey, I don't have a way of demoing this, obviously. So if I look at this thing, there's some horrendous music here that I good I, I blocked here. And what you're seeing here is that this guy's going to disturb it. And you could see that the wave is traveling along this rod system. And what you're finding on this rod system is that each of these rods, you're only seeing the endpoint of the rods. And what they have here is that there's a wire that connects all the rods together. So if I disturb the system up like this, then this one goes up, this one goes down, I mean, it goes up, and then eventually the energy then transfers. And as it transfers, it gets something like this. So when I look at the wave system on this wave machine, what you're seeing here is that you're seeing a pattern that looks something like this. So that's how you get the waves on the wave machine. So wave machine is what? It's a system of coupled oscillators here. So the important thing here is this now. The important thing is this. Mechanical waves require a medium. So Think about it this way. Can you imagine a wave without the rods of the wave machine? Right? And the only way you can see this wave is if you have those rods. If you don't have the rods, there's no way you can have a wave. That's the mechanical view of a, of a wave here. And if you look at, imagine the following thing. Can you imagine water waves? Without water? Can you have water waves without water, right? That's a silly remark. Or can you imagine sound waves without air. Impossible. That is what a mechanical wave is. So now I'm going to try to show you from what I said before. So if I move all the way back up here for a brief moment before I start to head back down, I want to Look at the two things from the historical viewpoint. When you walked in to the 1750s, you were steeped in mechanical viewpoints of the universe. So in this case here, for the mechanical part, mechanical waves required a medium. Now we move towards Maxwell's equations. When Maxwell's and his friends developed ENM, one of the key predictions was that light is an EM wave and always travels at the light speed. So now, moving back all the way down here, the main part of the lecture for Tuesday is then going to be here. I'm going to say that light was the primary actor in the special 
relativity, drama in the early 1900s. And the question really comes down to this. Maxwell equations predict B, the speed of light, to be a constant. Okay? So this light really means what? This light implies that it means what? That it never slows down, never speeds up, always moves at the speed of light C. So in which frame is the velocity of light always a constant? And so that's the question that we got to ask for next time.